Hello, this is Lucia, a geologist with the Nevada Division of Minerals. I would like to welcome you to this video in which we will review the basics of mineral identification. In this video, we will discuss the tools we have to help us identify minerals, and you will be introduced to many terms commonly used when identifying minerals. At the end of this video, we will identify a couple minerals together, and hopefully you will be ready to strike out on your own mineral identification adventure once we are done. Mineral identification is both challenging and fun. If it were simple, everyone would do it. But as with most anything that is challenging, the more you practice, the better you get. We have several tools that help us to identify minerals. Some are simple observation, like mineral color, luster, feel, smell, or taste, and some through actual tests perform on the minerals such as hardness, streak, or chemical reactivity. Not every observation or test needs to be performed every time. The tests and observations utilized most often are noted by asterisks on this screen. Let's review the tools. Color. Color is very important to note, and most of the time it can lead you in the right direction for mineral identification. But color is not a 100% foolproof method. On the left, we can see four different color varieties of quartz. And on the right, we see four different color varieties of fluorite. You should always document the color. However, if all other observations and tests point to another mineral except the color, don't disregard that mineral based on color alone. Luster. Luster of a mineral is commonly described as being glassy or vitreous, adamantine, waxy, silky, or pearly, resinous, metallic, or earthy. Minerals with a glassy or vitreous luster shine like glass. Minerals with an adamantine luster sparkle like a diamond. A mineral with a waxy, silky, or pearly luster has a dull shine and appears waxy like a candle or similar to a piece of silk or has a resemblance comparable to the surface of a pearl. Resinous minerals look like amber or hardened tree sap. Minerals with a metallic luster shine like a metal and minerals with an earthy luster are dull and look like chalk or dirt. Fracture refers to the way a mineral breaks or cracks. Conchoidal fractures look similar to ripples in a pond or a shell with smooth curved surfaces. Conchoidal fractures are what can be observed on broken glass. Uneven fractures make the surface of the mineral look rough and irregular. Minerals with hackley fractures have jagged sharp surfaces like that of broken metal. Minerals with earthy fractures break like clay or pieces of chalk. And minerals with a splintery fracture, these are the fibrous minerals, break off as elongated splinters. Diaphaneity refers to the mineral's ability to transmit light. Minerals are commonly described as being either transparent where light passes freely through the mineral, translucent, where light doesn't pass freely through the mineral, or opaque, where light cannot pass through the mineral at all. Another tool that can sometimes help to positively identify a mineral is how the mineral feels in your hand. Is it gritty or sandy, smooth, glassy, sharp, metallic, sticky, silky, waxy or powdery, or earthy or chalky. This observation isn't always helpful, but sometimes it comes in handy. Sometimes you just have to get all up in that mineral's business. Geologists are sometimes referred to as rock lickers for a reason. Yes, any respectable geologist has licked a rock. While not all rocks should be licked, it is sometimes necessary to make a positive identification. Halite, or salt, is quickly and easily identified using this tool. Smell may also be important. Sulfur smells like rotten eggs. Some minerals smell earthy, sour, sweet, and even like oil or petroleum. Don't be afraid to use your senses. Cleavage. 
Cleavage refers to the tendency of a mineral to break along one or more smooth, flat surfaces. Many minerals, such as quartz, form crystals with geometric form, but they do not have cleavage. For this reason, when they break, they will have uneven surfaces compared to those with cleavage. On a perfect mineral specimen, it is easy to observe cleavage. Simply count how many flat, parallel surfaces you can pinch between your thumb and index finger. We will demonstrate. For the demonstration, we will use arrows. The point of the arrow represents where your thumb and index finger would be placed. Minerals with basal cleavage have only one plane of cleavage, or only one flat surface that can be pinched between your fingers. Minerals with prismatic or non-prismatic cleavage have two planes of cleavage where one, two flat parallel surfaces can be pinched between your fingers. Minerals with cubic or rhombohedral cleavage have three planes of cleavage or one, two, three flat parallel surfaces that can be pinched between your fingers. Minerals with octahedral cleavage have four planes of cleavage or one, two, three, four parallel flat surfaces that can be pinched between your fingers. And minerals with dodecahedral cleavage have six planes of cleavage, but will not be demonstrated here because it would be visually confusing. Unfortunately, it is rare that one is handed a perfect single crystal of a mineral to identify, let alone crystals large enough to pinch but practicing with real perfect mineral crystals will help you to visually assess imperfect crystals for cleavage later on. Mineral habit or form refers to the way a mineral prefers to grow given enough space and materials to do so. Many minerals prefer to grow in a needle-like or acicular fashion. Other minerals like to grow in a bladed or tabular arrangement. Some minerals form dendritic or branched-like tree structures. Most of us have seen fool's gold or pyrite, which really likes to grow in the form of a cube, also known as equant. One of my favorites would be a prismatic crystal form with striations or parallel grooves on a surface. Finally, some crystals like to grow within each other, a mineral form referred to as twinning. A mass of minerals is known as a mineral aggregate, and they too can take distinctive forms which all have their own name. This slide shows common mineral aggregates and the respective name designation commonly referred to in mineral descriptions. This is a great graphic to refer back to when identifying minerals. Now I imagine you are thinking, wow, there are so many different crystals with a range of shapes. But all minerals actually fall into six basic crystal systems because crystals always grow according to simple mathematical laws. The six systems are cubic or isometric, tetragonal, hexagonal, orthorhombic, monoclinic, and triclinic. Yes, this slide shows seven crystal systems, but triagonal is commonly grouped with hexagonal. We will not review all of the crystal systems, but we wanted you to know they exist and be able to reference the terminology if needed. The last observable tool is guilt by association. In mineral descriptions, it is common that minerals which are associated with each other are listed. For example, azurite is commonly found with limonite and chalcopyrite, and fluorite is associated with specific suites of minerals in specific geologic environments. In some cases, when a mineral identifier is stuck between two possible candidates, knowing where the sample is from and identifying other minerals that may be in the sample can really help with positive identification. Guilt by association. Now let us move on to tools we use to test minerals. Meet your mineral identification test kit. A basic identification kit consists of some pretty common household items. A magnet, a steel nail, a hand lens or magnifying glass, a piece of copper or a pre-1982 penny, 
an unglazed porcelain streak plate, a form of weak acid, and an optional masonry drill bit. A 10% hydrochloric acid solution works best as the reaction is very visible. This can be obtained at a geological supply store. You can also use vinegar or lemon juice, but you may need to use a magnifying glass or scratch and powder the sample in order to observe the reaction. Another method would be to put the sample in a cup of vinegar or lemon juice and see if bubbles start to form and float to the surface. The reaction will increase slightly with time. Unglazed porcelain can be hard to find, but the back side of a glazed piece of tile will work. As for the penny, it needs to be pre-1982 because starting in 1983, pennies were made mostly of zinc and only have a copper coating. Of course, you will also need a reference guide for actually identifying the minerals. If you prefer a book, I recommend the National Audubon Society's Rocks and Minerals Identification Guide. It has many minerals and is relatively easy to navigate through. We will also be looking at some very helpful websites that are free to use later in this video. A black light with short wave and long wave capabilities is handy but not necessary. And if you really want to get into mineral identification and want to be more precise on your hardness test, which we will talk about next, the Deluxe Hardness Pick Set for Mineral Identification is really handy, but not cheap. So what do we do with all of these tools? Well, we perform tests on the minerals. One of the most important tests is hardness. Each mineral has a hardness. Some are soft enough to be scratched by your fingernail and some are nearly hard as diamonds. Diamond happens to be the hardest mineral. The most scale of mineral hardness is a scale that ranges from one to 10 that is used when identifying minerals, with one being the softest and 10 being the hardest. As you can see, your mineral identification kit is equipped with items necessary for testing hardness. Your fingernail has a hardness at 2.5, so if you can scratch the mineral with your fingernail, its hardness is less than 2.5. If you can't scratch the mineral with your fingernail, but can scratch it with a copper penny, the hardness is less than 3.5, but greater than 2.5. You get the picture. Hardness is one of, if not the most important test to perform on every mineral you attempt to identify. A mineral streak refers to the color of the powdered mineral residue when a sample is scraped across a plate of unglazed porcelain. Unlike the color of a mineral, the color of the streak is relatively consistent. If a mineral has no streak, it is noted as white or colorless. The streak test is also very important when identifying minerals. Other mineral properties that can be tested include radioactivity, magnetism, and reaction with acid. A Geiger counter can measure the amount of radiation coming off of a sample. This test is used, but not commonly. However, Testing whether the mineral is attracted to a magnet and if the mineral reacts with acid when it is put onto its surface are two tests that should always, always be performed. Many people get hung up when trying to identify a mineral by not completing these two quick and simple tests. Fluorescence is one of the most spectacular properties to see in a mineral. Certain minerals are made of elements that absorb ultraviolet light and get excited or jump up to a higher energy state as they do. When they calm down or drop to a lower energy state, light is emitted and they exhibit fluorescence. The display of fluorescence can help when identifying minerals. Specific gravity. To get the exact specific gravity of a sample, you need a sample that has no other minerals present, which doesn't really happen very often, and some high-end equipment. But to get a general idea of what the specific gravity is, you can perform the test yourself. Refer back to this screen if you would like to give this measurement a try. 
Now it's time for some mineral identification. We will now look at and identify two minerals. So let's get started. Here is our first mineral specimen. We can see it looks metallic and there aren't any definite crystals visible with the tools we are using. So this is a massive mineral aggregate. We will first see if the mineral can be scratched by a fingernail, which it cannot. Next, we will try the copper. If you look carefully, you can see that the copper is left on the rock. So we will move up on the hardness scale and see if our sample will scratch glass, which it does. So the hardness is greater than 5.5. Don't be afraid to really put some pressure on the glass plate to see if a mineral will scratch or not. I did not show the nail in this video because it was really hard to see, but it does scratch the mineral, so the hardness is less than 6.5. Now we will scrape the mineral across the white plate, and we can clearly see the streak is black. Now it's time for the magnet. Yes, this mineral is very magnetic. Next we will test with some acid. We can see a reaction, but when we thin the acid out, it is easy to see that the sites where the reaction is taking place correspond with some white spots that are in the sample. This is not the mineral we are trying to identify. However, calcite is a mineral that reacts vigorously with acid, so it is probably a safe assumption that the white spots in this sample are calcite. But what are they with? Let's continue. When identifying rocks and minerals, it is good practice to write down your observations and results from the test you perform, also known as the data. Here is our data. We will use this data in the next phase of our mineral identification exercise, and you can refer back to this later if needed. We will use the Mineralogical Society of America's Mineral Identification Key, which ultimately links with a very large online database, mindat.org, which we will look at in a few minutes. We will click on the link to the Mineral Identification Key. We arrive at the first question, is the luster metallic or submetallic? Our mineral was metallic, so we will choose yes. Next, will the mineral leave a mark on paper or is the hardness less than 2.5? No, our mineral would tear up some paper. Next, can the mineral be scratched by a knife? Though we did not test with a knife, we can select no because it scratched glass, so a knife could not have scratched it. So when we select no, We are redirected to this intimidating table, but don't run away. It's really not that bad. We can eliminate most of these minerals very quickly. First, the hardness has to be greater than five and a half. So let's eliminate all of the minerals with a hardness of five and a half. Next, let's look at the color of the streak. If it isn't black, it's gone. Moving on, we will get rid of any mineral that doesn't have black as a mineral color listed. And finally, we will look at the notes. There is only one mineral left that might fit the bill, but it is only weakly magnetic. So all of these minerals are eliminated and we scroll down. All of these minerals have a hardness that fits our sample. So let's look at the streak and eliminate the one that's not black. Next, let's move to color and eliminate any mineral that doesn't have black as a mineral color listed. Now, since we are towards the end of our list, let's look at habit and get rid of any that don't occur as massive mineral aggregates. And finally, we will look at the notes of the remaining candidates. And we can see that there is only one that mentions being strongly magnetic and the mineral is magnetite. This sounds like our culprit. If we click on the mineral name, which is a hyperlink, it will take us to another page.
This is Mindat.org, a large online database for minerals. We are taken directly to the Magnetite page where you can view photos of the mineral along with a wealth of other information. If the results aren't what you expected, it is always wise to go back and observe or test some more. Also, if you get to a result that is suiting but one of your observations or tests didn't quite match up, go back and assess the test or observation to figure out what may have went wrong. This is where you learn and grow as a mineral identifying aficionado. Mindat.org also has a form that can be utilized to identify minerals. There are lots of advanced options, but fill in the data you have and review the minerals that show up. You can see, after entering the data we have for our sample, magnetite is a 93% match. If there was an option for magnetic, I'm sure that number would rise to 100. Let's work through one more mineral together. First, let's see how hard it is. It can't be scratched with a fingernail, but it can very easily be scratched with a piece of copper. So the hardness is greater than two and a half and less than three and a half. The streak is hard to see, but it is white or very light green. We can see this sample is not magnetic and it does not react with acid. We can't see any crystals, so this mineral is also a massive mineral aggregate and it has a porcelain or opaline-like surface with a waxy luster. Here is our documented data from our test and observation. So let's go back to the Mineralogical Society of America's mineral identification key and start answering the questions. The luster is not metallic or submetallic, so we will select no. The mineral has a light green streak, so we will say yes to the mineral having a definitely colored streak. The color may have been more observable if we would have used a black streak plate. Again, we will be redirected to a table and will immediately scroll past anything with a hardness of 2.5 or below. Doing this leaves us with these remaining candidates. Again, we will start with the hardness where we can eliminate a few off of the list right away. Moving on to the streak, we will try to eliminate any mineral with a streak that isn't light green or white, but unfortunately, there are none. Next, let's move to the color and remove the ones where green isn't mentioned. Now we are down to five minerals. If we look at the descriptions of the crystal habit, and the notes, it appears as though chrysocolla is the best candidate since it is the only mineral with mention of opaline or porcelain-like masses or crusts. We will click on the mineral name to go to Mindat. And we can see that the middle photo pretty closely resembles our specimen. I would feel very comfortable calling this mineral chrysocolla. Looking again at the mindat.org advanced mineral search form and filling in our data, we can see chrysocolla is a pretty close match being third on the list. Malachite is much brighter green and vitreous than our mineral and tangdenite is too soft. One last thing I would like to say on mineral identification. Always remember the law of least astonishment. Unless you have been to some obscure place in search of some obscure mineral, if you identify a specimen and end up on a mineral that is incredibly rare or only found in one place of the world, it is probably not the mineral you have in your hand. With time, you will become familiar with the common varieties of minerals. Also, if you happen to land on an obscure mineral species, identification sources almost always make mention of similar species. Check them out to see if they fit the bill of the mineral specimen you are trying to identify. This concludes our introduction to mineral identification. Remember these few things as you move forward. Never overlook a test if you are stumped. The law of least astonishment. Practice makes perfect.
And the more minerals you see, the better you get. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, send them to me at the email address listed on this screen. Now go get your Min ID on and have a great day.